In this video, we're going to discuss how to set the mood for your D&D game. Hello and welcome to Attacks of Opportunity. As always, I'm your host, John Sprunk, and our returning champion, Eric Hardenbrook, is here <laughs> with prizes totaling 14 million eighty-eight thousand. And <laughs> Would that be nice? Big money! <laughs> Big prizes! Oh, so today we're going to talk about two things, actually, two topics. Um, sort of connected in some ways. Uh, the first is setting the mood for your game. And the second is the expectation of players and how they can change and develop over time. So uh, I think I planned on starting with setting the mood first since that's the order we met Landon in. Uh, super. All right, all right. Let's so, dive in, man. Yeah, I wrote some thoughts down. This is a... Uh, a topic that at first blush I kind of felt was um, uh, easy or not very deep. But the more I thought about it and the more I started thinking, you know, writing stuff about it, the deeper in the rabbit hole I went. So, I mean, this had, this is bigger than I think most people um, realize at first glance. Uh, certainly something not, not a lot of DMs spent a lot of time in my experience purposely setting mood you know and doing it you know with a purpose there but uh so vital to the game actually so um there's so many different ways we can set the mood right we can set it externally like what's going on in the room we're playing in we can do it with things we're doing in the game that can affect how things are perceived by our players uh, and players do it to each other they say and do things that um, set the mood for each other. Um, so why don't you kick off, I know you've got some ideas about this, so why don't you kick off what's on top of your head right now? So I think one of the things that is important that I've heard a couple of variations on people being upset about this or that or the other thing. And I will tell you, and I, I even dragged them out because they're right off the shelf right here. I have house rules, which you can't really see. House rule number one. House rule number one is this is a game. Mm -hmm. We're getting together to have fun. If you're not comfortable, if you're not at ease with the people around you, if you're not into playing the game, it doesn't matter what the DM does. It doesn't matter what room you're in. You're not going to have a good time. You, you've got to be of the mindset that, hey, I'm playing a game and I'm doing this with my friends so that I can have fun. Now, how you manage various aspects of that, that's where the details come in. Right. So, you know, and, and it starts with, with the, the room that you're in when you play, really. Um, and I don't want this to ever come across like a knock against game shops, because if you're sitting around a, a plastic folding table in a, you know, in a metal chair in the middle of a game shop, but you're having a great time, you've set the perfect mood, you know, as long as you're having fun. Now, some of the other stuff that we may or may not talk about here, I think, affects that you know there are certain things you can do in the game shop and there are certain things you can't do in the game shop now there are certain things that you can do in the game shop that you can't do at home particularly if the game shop has a lot of space if they have a lot of tables you know and you want to use miniatures or dioramas or anything that goes along with that or if you're playing a, a particular miniatures game mm -hmm. you know we're talking D D, but you can get into you know, battle tactics of miniatures and all kinds of other stuff. You need space for that. And sometimes, you know, your one bedroom apartment that has your four players all sprawled around your living room, you just don't have the space to do that kind of thing. That's a good point. So 
there's advantages and disadvantages to wherever you're at. Yeah, that's vital. I think the space that you're in, you could run the exact same adventure with the exact same players in two different locations and get a different experience based on uh, the surroundings. Um, uh, my, always my two things that jump out like the space of a D&D. There's more, but the first two things I think of is the space. I know I've played in spaces where a bunch of guys were crowded into a small area trying to play D&D or some of the role-playing game. And it's smelly, humid. Uh, there's no room to spread out. Um, it, just, it, it takes away from the experience because I'm worried about the real life uncomfortability of the situation. Uh, I like to spread out. You know, I, I, have to have, I also have to have a table. Either, even if it's just my own little table, like a TV tray, I got to have space for my dice, my books, my character sheet, pencils. That's if I'm playing. If I'm DMing, I need several tables like that at least. Otherwise, I just don't feel comfortable enough to enjoy the experience, just to unwind with it. So, and uh, also, the older I get, the more the comfortable factor of the chair plays in. Uh, I can no longer sit in a folding chair for four hours or five hours. It's not going to happen. I'm just going to have to get up and go somewhere else. I have to agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but yeah, you know, I I remember many many hours of, you know, sitting on the floor leaning against my buddy's couch or, you know, sprawled out in the basement, you know, on the on the one carpet in the middle of the room, with just a bunch of stuff all laying around on the floor. Um, those days are are not for me anymore. I don't think I could <laughs> lay on the floor and play. Um, but, it, you know, if that's what you get, if that's what you're, if that's the space you've got available, man, you, know, you can make it work, make it work. And I think that's the thing that, that has always attracted me about this game is that for all, any of the other things we'll, we get to, if you have paper, pencil, some dice and a rule book, it's, it's all in your imagination. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, um, you can you can close your eyes, and you can wander a wilderness path in your head. You can, if you have a good storyteller as a as a game master, you know they can really set the mood. Even even if the area where you're sitting isn't necessarily as comfortable as you want it to be. That's true. That's true. I shouldn't be a, a snob about it. I've been lucky. I've almost always had a nice big table, a couple of chairs, but uh, the older I get, the, the less comfortable I am being uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and that's fair. And, and I think there are certain aspects of um, this the mood thing that we're talking about that as you go along, you can collect little things along the way and just sort of store them and, and keep them on hand for when you have that time where you're like, Oh, I need a little something that's going to help the mood of this game. You know, whatever that may be. Right. Yeah, I agree. Um, and this plays into, you know, the space that you're in lighting important, very important, obviously enough light to see the character, you know, the dice rolls and the character sheet at a minimum. Um, but, uh, you know, light is such an important mood setter for uh, human beings. If you uh, can dim the lights at times when you're describing a, a dark forest or an evil castle, that can play into it. If you have the ability to, like, do a mini light show or, you know, project images on the wall, all that kind of stuff can help people get immersed in what you're doing. And even though they're relatively cheap and simple, you know, uh, devices, uh, it can go a long way. And the same with sound, you know, if, uh, if your DM likes to use, um, you know, sound effects or battle music, my group loves battle music. They, whenever that fight starts, they remind me, where's the music at? Cause they won't, you know, they won't fight without the battle music anymore. But, uh, cause it, yeah, it gets them in the mood. It's like, you know, hearing the old Star Trek, dun, 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 dun. They hear that and they know there's a there's a fight with a Klingon coming. So, uh, 
so I, I want to I, I want to tell a little story to go along with that to sort of get the more of a, the concept if I can, and hopefully I'll be half as good a storyteller as the DM that did this for me. Okay. Um, this game we were playing in, and I think I've mentioned it before. Um, I was I was playing an uh, well, they call them oath breakers now, anti paladin basically. Mm -hmm. um, and we had traveled to this uh, plane where there was a uh, this demon that we were attempting to reach or get to. I, I don't remember all the details. But as we entered, as we stepped through the portal onto this plane, he started playing music. Um, and I don't know if you know the piece particularly, but it was the, the, the track, One of These Days, from Pink Floyd's album, Metal. Okay. And along with the guitar, it's bass guitar, and it, they have this sound of swirling wind. And he happened to have a, a blue light bulb so he turned that on so the room had a bluish tint and there's this sound of the bass music but also the wind in the background as he's describing this icy plane and right around the three and a half minute mark the like the only words of the song come out they're like it's like one of these days i'm gonna cut you into little pieces hmm. and it sounds like a demon's voice and he just led up to that and as soon as that hit Bam. He's like, there's the fortress. The demon comes rolling out. What do you do? And, and it was amazing. I mean, it's been decades since we played that, but all it was, was one song and a blue light bulb. Amazing. And, and it just, it wedged in there. It stuck. So these little things um, that we're talking about and, 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 you know, we didn't need to have the blue light bulb on all night. These things are can be moments. They can be pieces of your entire game night. You know, that special boss fight or whatever. Or like you say, oh, okay, it's combat music time. And it doesn't, I think a lot of people think about the music as, uh, they may get locked into particular things. And that's, the other reason I want to bring out what music that was because it's classic rock. And I don't think a lot of people think of that when they think music for a game, they're kind of going with, you know, some kind of vaguely medieval, <laughs> you know, forest sounds, or I, I don't know, something that sounds not like, you know, a modern bass guitar. Um, but it, it all depends on what kind of game, you're playing and if that really if it fits the mood yeah it's well we i mean obviously music uh is such a powerful thing for for people i remember playing D D in high school with friends and not as like the dm not on purpose we'd have music in the background we'd have the doors or judas priest and it wasn't to set a mood exactly it was just background music for us to play by but when i think back to those adventures that soundtrack is still in there. I, when I hear those songs now, I think back to the adventure we were going through when I was listening. I mean, it, and it's just such a wonderful rem reminder, uh, even with, not on purpose. Um, yeah, and little things. You know, if you're describing something, you know, creepy, and turn the lights off and put a flashlight under your face, like the old ghost story way. But, the players will not be able to look away from you while you're describing the, the scene. That's going to be something that is, it's just so simple. It takes, you know, five seconds to set up, but uh, it's just a little bit of theater. You know, um, I'm not suggesting people invest in multi-thousand dollar sound systems and light shows for this, unless you're wealthy, which is wonderful. You don't need all that. Um, something simple that just sets a little bit of a mood and, and just locks your players into that moment. Like you were locked into that song, you know, that all this time it's as crystal in your memory, I'm sure as the day it happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think the music can be whatever, whatever fits, you know, if it's something that, um, and, and it depends, it depends on where your campaign goes as well. Um, so I'll give you an example. I don't like, 
Um, I was never, ever a fan of the barrier peaks. Okay. I don't like mixing laser guns and future technology with my D&D. I, I, I hate it. I won't do it. If you play my game, you'll never see it. You won't see a cannon. You won't see a flintlock. I hate them. They don't go together with my magic. My swords and sorcery, no. Um, but if that's your jam, if that's your game, then get some spacey stuff out there. Go look up classical music. Get the, um, I'm drawing a blank on the composer's name, the, the Symphony of the Planets. You know, know just what you mean, but yes. To, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, I knew that right until you said. Yeah, wow. Well. It's not quite my <laughs> genre of choice, but yeah, I'm a little familiar. Um, yeah, oh, and don't look, yeah. don't look up the lyrics for that stuff either. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, no, because you may be disappointed. Um, I didn't... There's one that they use all the time. It's um, <sighs> Carmilla Barona, yeah. and it's it's that dun 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. And right. I looked up the words to it one time, and it's like the flowers of spring, they bloom so nicely. And I'm like, <laughs> that does not fit at all. What I no, no, you've 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 you've, you've done something bad to the mood. <laughs> yeah. If you're playing a Star Wars role playing game, I highly suggest having the soundtracks <laughs> nearby. Start sure. a session with you know the the theme and uh, but just that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're right. It, it's such an easy thing to do, um, and it, it lends a lot to it. Um, uh, next thing I had on my mind was the setting that the game that the adventure takes place in. Um, whether you use a homebrew or a pre-published, you know, by the Wizards of the Coast or you know any game system. They all have tons of settings out there, and they all have uh, different themes, different moods uh, set in them. I'm thinking stuff like Ravenloft. Um, oh, yeah. You know, obviously it's got some, some tone to it. Um, but one thing I always think of, though, is it's how the DM presents it. You could play a Ravenloft game with as a Care Bear Wonderland with like unicorn grows and, you know, fairies sprinkling dust every, you could do it because the setting is just the people and places and you can relate that however you want to. You could take the Forgotten Realms and turn it into a Fallout 4 dystopian post-apocalyptic nightmare. That's how you're interpreting. And the important thing is not exactly what the setting is to me. It's what my DM how they describe it, how they present it to us and, and how I present it to my players. Such a big thing, you know, um, a big city that your players go to, if you describe it with these bright colors and cheerful talk and ostentatious displays of wealth everywhere, that's definitely one mood for that city versus a ramshackle village where there's beggars in the street and every tavern's like a dive bar with people getting fights, totally different vibe. And you could describe one way or the other way, it doesn't really matter, but how you use your words is gonna inform your players about the mood. And that's gonna set the tone for that, for that place. And that's important because all they know of your setting is what you tell them, what you show them. Yeah, I... I agree with you 100% about using your how you use your words using your words matters um, and and this is something for for younger players particularly if I'm dealing with like my daughter or her friends or anything like that um, I tell them there is no subject in school that you should skip out on you can't let anything slide because you need to know something about all kinds of things when you're starting to talk about this. And I learned so many different pieces of different things when I decided I needed to do research as a DM, you know, okay, they're all going to get on a boat and they're going to take that boat from this port to that port. Is it called a boat or is there another name for it? You know, and you start 
looking up little things about tall ships and sails and masts and, you know, how do they turn? How do they float? What are the things called? They don't say left and right, <laughs> you know? So those, those particular words matter. They help with exactly what you're saying, you know? Okay. I, I need to, I need to turn the, tur- you, you turn into um, Vicini from uh, Princess Bride. Oh, okay. Do that thing and that other thing. <laughs> it loses something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think that, well, I mean, being writers, I think that we have a little bit of a leg up because we already think in terms of language and how different words evoke different feelings and different thoughts. Um, but anybody can learn. That's not magic. Anybody can learn that. And it amazes me that, you know, Everybody that I know that plays Dungeons and Dragons that has for years develops such an interesting vocabulary that more people don't use, you know, um, you know, the, the weaponry and armor types and uh, fortifications and siege weaponry and different kinds of sailing ships that from the you know medieval times or whatever. It's just, but your players was, love to hear that fed back to them, you know, what kind of ship are we on is important. Is it, you know, is it a, a caravel or is it, you know, a galley? And there's a big difference. So um, it's a sloop. Yeah, a sloop. <laughs> uh, are we in a castle or are we in a tower? You know, these, <laughs> these terms have different meanings. So how you set up description and uh, is, is big. Uh, I, I always, almost always have like a paragraph of description for a new place they go to, whether it's a town or a dungeon or whatever it is, I have a pre-generated, pre-made written um, uh, text that I read from. It's just how old modules did it, and that's how I train myself to play D&D. And then I also usually have um, additional things that they can discover or unlock some kind of way, which can open up more uh, descriptions. And, you know, I will never describe the Temple of Elemental Evil, the same way I would describe, you know, uh, well, Tomlet, you know, the village, you know, the, right. the words you use are super important. So, yeah, we both agree on that. And uh, um, the Thethoris is not a, uh, not your enemy. If you don't know a lot of words that mean the same thing, get a cheap thesaurus and keep it nearby. And then when you need another word to mean tall or evil or castle, then look it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And and so rolling in, rolling into I think I think we can roll into some visual stuff from what you've described because one of the things when when I'm if I'm if I have time on my hands and I'm particularly inspired about a a setting um I have been known to sketch out what it is that the people see. Um come up with my I've come up with like page upon page of my own pictures. Uh, part of that is because I'm also an artist some of the time. <clears throat> I come up with my own pictures so that I can present to them what it is, you know, that they see in, in the distance, you know, oh, this is what the fortress looks like. This is sort of where it, where the wall openings show up or the, this is where the things have crumbled. Um, Little things like that from a visual perspective, um, I think help. And I also don't, here's a, here's a tip for DMs. Don't just say, oh, it's the Zorn from the, you know, the monster that's coming to get you. Describe it, mm-hmm. you know? Here's this barrel-shaped thing with more than two legs and a giant mouth at the top of its head, you know? And then people are like, I don't know what that is, but it scares me. Let's, <laughs> you know, as opposed to if you just give them the name, it doesn't have that same evocative uh, nature to it. Yeah, the first time a party encounters uh, any kind of creature, it don't give them a name, just describe it. And then, you know, the 14th time they're fighting orcs, they know what an orc is, sure. But the first time should be like, you know, it's, it's, and the more burly and savage you describe it, even though it's just an orc, you know, in a monster manual, you can play it up more dramatically that they're, they're, you know, they're impressed to fight it. They, they're geared up. 
the last thing you want for combat in D and D is to become routine or dry or, you know, or boring because that's, you know, that's a big part of the experience. Well, you could start laying over, and giving them surprises, you know, describing an orc again and again and again might be tedious. And then there's that one time that you've actually laid a character class over that orc. And suddenly it's not just the orc, it's the leader of the orcs. And he is about to whoop your butt Mm -hmm. because he's got four levels of fighter or, you know, something along those lines. Like that is not the orc we were expecting. Exactly. Yeah, those are great. And uh, I love, like, we use Roll20, you know, for the COVID. We might use it afterwards. I, I love it. Um, one of my favorite features is, you know, I can find, and I'm not much of an artist, but I can find an image online and then, you know, post it to their computers. Like, you know, there's so much artwork online, you know, free stuff. You know, if, if, I'm, if they're going to investigate a castle, I can find a thousand castle drawings, pick the closest one, put it up on the computer, I can describe it while I'm showing this picture. Boom. You know what I mean? And uh, it adds so much, I think, to the... It's one thing to hear description, but not everybody's uh, auditory in the same way that can visualize the same degree. Some folks need a little physical representation. To show them both at the same time really slams home. Um, Even for monsters, unfamiliar monsters, although... I don't do it too much because one of my players have played for a long time. If I show them a picture of a Zorn, they know right what it is. I can describe it maybe a little off so that to kind of disguise it for the first time or two. So I don't do that too much. But, you know, if I find a funky drawing of a Zorn, that's not quite the usual drawing. But, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, those are using all the senses you can to sort of to lock people in. So – and and to tie into that, do you ever use props? Um, not too much. I mean, we use a battle map and miniature that kind of stuff. But like, uh, you mean like a prop? Like, I had an idea which I stole from somebody online about um, they go into a village. There's a message board, and actually making the message board in real life, they could look at. Now I made a virtual one for our online game, but I haven't. I'm not super handy or woodworky or, you know, clothing, clothing maker. <laughs> uh, that's why I wanted to bring it up because you don't have to be. Um, you can, particularly right now, well, okay, as we're recording this, we're, um, what, a week out from Halloween? Not quite. Not quite a week out from Halloween. Yep. So right now, in the clearance section is a bunch of Halloween stuff. So you can hit up the dollar store and you can get like part of the pirates costume set or whatever Mm -hmm. is like this cheap little uh, round plastic money that looks like doubloons or, or whatever, dude, grab that, put it in a dice bag, put a couple of, um, the little crystal thingies that you put in the bottom of plants that they sell at the dollar store. Okay. Those are suddenly gems. You have gems, you have money, you have a random brass key laying around the house. You drop them all in a dice bag. You're like, Oh, and this is in the treasure Blah, and drop it on the table. Very cool. I mean, it, it just, and you can do it for like two bucks. If this doesn't have to be this, massive investiture of time and effort and artistic ability um scrounge you know dig into if you're if you're a parent dig into your kid's play box the toy box look for pieces and bits and parts because they the kids have probably lost the other parts already (laughs) so if you've got things left over that look like they might work or who knows Um, and the other thing with that is look for, um, sometimes official things will come out. They used to come out with modules, you know, things you could cut out, um, pages that had specific pieces. They're like, okay, you cut this out and hand it to the players, that kind of a thing. Right. And they, eons ago, they did this in, uh, Dragon Magazine. So you can 
grab even if you even if you you could do it with a regular deck of cards but i happened to find these that were in the magazine and this is and i the deck of many things yep so you can literally hand it to whatever player and say if you're going to pick one pick one and suddenly they're like oh wait a minute this is this is there's something more to this now you know and and you have this physical thing that you could just hand them a deck of cards and say okay pick one yeah i've heard of that one that's a good one um so yeah i mean it, it's it doesn't have to be crazy involved um it's it's one or two little things and if it's something that you don't have an attachment to, you know, if it's a, a handful of pieces from the dollar store or whatever, and you throw them in a little bag, give it to them. Yeah. And be like, no, you found it. Keep it. <laughs> you know, put it in with your dice. That's your character's, your character has that. You know, I went to the restaurant and I threw a quarter in one of those, little uh gumball machine things and it dropped out a plastic ring guess what went in treasure the next time we were playing you know and then you and then you've got a thing you can describe well it's sort of silver and there's a green looking maybe gem on top you're not sure roll an appraisal check Mm -hmm. is it worthless or are you just not seeing the value Uh, (laughs) it's worth 25 cents (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> I give you a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> so next thing um, from on my thinking here is uh, for mood setting is NPC interactions. Um, huge factor in my games, uh, especially, um, you know, if, if, if the PCs meet NPCs who are surly and cruel, they perceive the game that they're playing one way. If everyone's nice and friendly, it's the opposite. Um, I figure most DMs strive to make realistic NPCs. I know I do. You know, I, I try to, you know, if they're overly dramatic, they're melodramatic, you know, they're a little over the top sometimes to, you know, to accentuate uh, one other uh, personality facets. But, you know, you go into a tavern in most of my games, you're going to find people you'd find in a tavern, you know, the servers, bartender, patrons, couple drunks, bar flies, what have you. And if you would approach these people, they would act in a way that I thought was appropriate for the setting and the place that you're at. Um, I think most games probably do the same sort of thing. I would just add to that a couple of things you can do is consider that people in different places are going to have different attitudes. A tavern owner in a small one-horse village probably will have different perspective on life and adventures than a tavern owner in Waterdeep, you know, who has a big establishment. You know, they've right. seen different things, they have different opinions about stuff, and you'll make your world and your mood different if you have each of these people have different things. That comes down to observing people. You know, if you travel a little bit, There are feels to a small town. People know each other. There's more of a sense of community usually. People gossip because they know each other a lot more than downtown Philadelphia, where you might not know anybody who lives more than a block away from you as far as, you know, neighbor-wise. It's a whole different feel, and people act differently in those situations. Um, This is where voice acting can come into play a little bit. Um, you don't have to, but people get freaked out sometimes. They think that that's something only like trained actors can do. No, an eight-year-old can do voice acting. You know, a four-year-old does it for make-believe. Um, it doesn't have to be a spot-on impersonation of Sean Connery to be fun or interesting. And if you're able to give different NPCs a different voice, even if it's just a slight alteration, you can kind of convince your players they're talking to a real person, not some faceless bot 
that just hands over beer for, for money. You know what I mean? You give some personality. And then they want to interact more because it's fun. And you know, the more they interact with the NPC, the more you can do improv back and forth. And it just usually generates its own interesting interactions simply because you put on a funny accent for 10 seconds. Um, but it's important for mood because, again, they only know these NPCs how you portray them. If you portray every NPC in the game with the exact same voice, the exact same delivery, the exact same um, down-to-business attitude, they'll think your setting is entirely populated by these people. They're all drones. So um, as you mature as a DM, I think most people do this anyway, but just a hint that, you know, just a little bit of practice and effort can go a long way with this. You don't need to be a theater major with, you know, five, you know, productions under your belt to be a good actor as far as D&D goes. You just got to be human and, and watch how people talk and how they act. And I have to say, I'm terrible with voices and things like that. I can't do it well. I'm, I, I, I struggle with that. And one of the little keys that I have found to that is I don't try to modulate my actual voice a lot. I may go up or down a little depending, you know, or try to get gruff and gravelly or whatever. <laughs> it doesn't have to be more than that. But, but one piece you could put with that is if there is a pattern to how a particular person or type of people speak, mm-hmm. if you're in a new country in this world, wherever that is, and all of the people there speak in a formal and forthright manner so that you have to pay attention to each and every word as opposed to some guy at the tower is like, hey, you want something, whatever. Though the, the manner in which the words are delivered without necessarily changing your voice, mm-hmm. you know, the, if you know there's a character out there, let's say he's a... Um, a sneak thief and you're trying to stop him from grabbing the jewel. And you know that every time he says some, says a word that ends with an S he always ends it with a lisp. And, and, and you, you could just, just, you could start to work that into the character's speech. And then even if he's in disguise, you describe a character that's in disguise, but he can't help himself when he gets to that last word. Mm -hmm that ends with a if he blows his roll, you do that. And some suddenly a player is like, oh, wait, you know, I heard, I heard that. Right. And it's, it's, it's not, it's like you say, it's not voice acting, you know, it's not, it's not something I'll, I'll never be able to come out with funny voices and, and do huge range of different things like that. But I tie together little things with what we've said at first with the choosing your words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So important Um, for voice acting. I mostly just think of a movie or a TV role that's close enough and try and mimic it. I figure if I get half of the way there, the players are going to know what I'm trying to do. They know my Sean Connery. I don't like Sean Connery at all, but they know what I'm trying to do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all my dwarves have Sean Connery's, well, my version of his voice. But they know. They hear that voice and they go, oh, that's a dwarf. I'm like, I ain't got to tell you it's a dwarf. You know it's a dwarf. But uh, yeah, and it, these little things like we're saying that they add up. Um, theme. I don't know um, how much you work with theme in your campaign building. And Well, you're a writer, so I know you, know, you, you work with theme, but do you put that into your campaign adventures too? I try, okay. but there's a, there's a meme on the internet. Uh, it's a picture of like what every DM thinks their campaign is going to be. And it's like a picture of the Lord of the Rings. And then underneath it, it says how your campaign always turns out. And it's from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so, they're so right. Because I, I try for those sort of things. And 
I think I was working towards it in this last campaign, but it's the sort of thing that that those little bits of the mood you have to you have to be able to go with the flow of how your players are feeling. Mm-hmm. If you try to force it and they're not feeling it, it's not going to work. No matter how hard you try, no, you could be you could be a professional voice actor and it still won't work. Right. Yeah, um, I'm a lot like you, I think. I try. Um, I don't always know what the themes are until we start playing. Um, I'm, I'm very big on laying the groundwork and letting the party go where it wants. You know, they usually go where I think they're going to go. I've known them for, you know, so long. It's fine. But sometimes they'll still surprise me and go off the beaten path, and I love that. So I, I don't try to corral them back. But I'll use theme... Let's say, example, if uh, the, the major part of this campaign will be tracking down a villain, you know, bringing them to justice, you know, it's a, a cop and robber kind of thing, then I might try to insert encounters along the way that illustrate right and wrong. Like maybe they'll go to a village and they'll be asked by the villagers to act as judges uh, in a criminal case. Um, maybe they'll be accused of a crime falsely or not and they'll have to go to court and defend themselves um anything I can or, do not. Kill, or not or just break <laughs> out and kill everybody that happens once in a while but uh you know if, if justice is the theme of the campaign i will try to illustrate it with some encounters and some role play opportunities just to give them even if they don't under even if they don't consciously know it the sense of ah this whole adventure ties together and sometimes it's just a subconscious thing of, you know, what kind of monsters you put in, what kind of encounter, what kind of role playing you put in there. Um, not every campaign works well with that. Some campaigns, if all they want to do really is, is fight monsters and get rich, there's not a whole lot usually to work with as far as, you know, lofty themes go. But um, I, I do try to keep it in mind, or if a campaign has been going on for a little while, in my quiet moment outside the game, I will try to think about where have they been? Where are they at? Where are they going? Where does this all tie together? You know, what can I set up for them in the future thematically that will give them that sense of, aha, you know, we've been working towards something we didn't even realize we're working towards. And that's all part of mood because I, I always feel that, you know, we played in so many games, you know, I, both of us have played so long. Some different groups we played with, Nothing wrong with a group that just says, there's no, it's free form. We're going to get together for three hours. The DM will randomly roll what monsters we fight. We fight one, then the other, then the next. We loot all the bodies. We level up. That's our game. There's no story. There's no setting. It's just whatever it is, it is. Nothing wrong with that. Other people will go the exact opposite, and everything is story. I play with DMs where you could go three, four, five full sessions without a combat. Because they're just telling a story and you're just interacting with NPCs like your character in a book. And that's what you do. So there's an incredible uh, spectrum there. But they both do have mood. Even a hack and slash, there's a mood there. It's bloody and loot friendly, but there's still a mood. And if that's what the players want, you can definitely encourage that or discourage that behavior based on what you feed them. I, I think you kind of touched on something early on in what you were saying there that um, I have been uh, in a, my most recent campaign, I've been trying to work the characters around to discovering the greater goal on their own. And, and I continually put similar pieces for all of the bad guys. Like part of what they're um, the bad guys and, and for whoever's listening out of character knowledge doesn't count. <laughs> they're attempting to stop the cult that is trying to free the chained God. Okay. And the, these, these breakers, these are, are basically followers of chaos. They want 
They want to see the world burn specifically. They intend to tear it apart literally. And they've been slowly building towards this. And as you say, eventually they're like, wait a minute. Is this another one of those chain guys? I look for the following pieces because that's part of building that. Then you're, then you're in, then they get it. They're like, Oh, wait a minute. Are we going there again? Do we, I hate the Crimson Crescent. Those guys suck. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what you want, right? You want an emotional reaction for the character of true, but also for the player. The players are there for a reason. If they're not, if they're not emotionally invested at all, it's no more than playing Monopoly or Parcheesi. You're just rolling dice and moving stuff around. There's got to be a uh, emotional content, as Bruce Lee would say. I yeah. Totally agree. Um, players have a huge effect on the mood. Um, I always tell, I mean, you probably watch some of these videos I have on my solo, talking about DMing, you know, and some hints and some stuff I've learned. And I try to hammer home all the time, which I will again. Sorry, viewers. Um, this is a collaborative game. Um, the DM is the final arbiter of the referee, but you can't play it alone. And if you try to treat your players like puppets, that you tell them what to do and what to say and who to talk to and where to go and who to kill, not to kill, well, you're just playing solitaire. That defeats the entire purpose. The fun is that you guys tell a story together. Some pieces you've laid out for them to find, discover, interact with, kill, loot, whatever. But some pieces they bring to the table themselves. And that is where the magic happens. It's that alchemy of all your personalities and your characters' personas all working together with a setting you've devised and some set piece adventures and all this and only works it's only magic if everybody gets to contribute how they can um and so the players do have a lot to say about mood or the tone some people are naturally just jovial happy go lucky people if you get a group of all of them i don't care what horrible dystopian (laughs) evil world you put them in you're not going to beat that out of them they're going to be those people (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're, gonna, yeah, they're playing assassins. They would be the happiest assassins you ever saw. They'll be carrying uh, a bag of flaming rocks going. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. Um, if, you're, if people are all like me, where they're all cynical sons of guns, we got a group of those. I don't care if you put them in the most colorful, cheerful land. We're going to find the ugly side of it, and, you know, and, and then bitch and moan about how things are so horrible here. You know, that... <laughs> People do bring that to the table too. And that's part of why I would tell people, if you find a table full of people that you click with, that they see the game the way you see the game and um, that get the same sort of things out of the game as you do, that is rarer than gold. You hold on to that because that does not come around very often. One-on-one, sure, but to get four, five, seven people of a similar mindset that want to play a game like this together, if you can keep them together, that is, there's nothing better than that in my experience. I think I've mentioned this before, but maybe not. Um, I, I agree with you so much more than just on a base level there. We actually, that, that house rules thing, one of the other house rules that's on there, nobody joins the group unless it's a unanimous vote. Mm-hmm. If there's only one person that goes, no, I'm not getting the vibe from that person, that person doesn't join the game. And it, that's a hard, it's a harsh rule. It's, it's harder than you think because of all of the things that I think we've mentioned in the past about relationships between your people and your players and, you know, we had, uh, when we did the, the session with the, the women in gaming, your wife was on, my wife was on. Mm-hmm. There are relationships there. And that rule has actually killed one of my campaigns before. Because somebody said, hey, I want to bring my new significant other. And a couple of people in the game went, no. And that was it that per- that player was done they're like hey, look if i can't bring my significant other mm. i'm out 
and it was a it was a vital character to the game and and it just sort of things just sort of fell apart after it's that tough. it's real tough um i've had similar things happen with friends and family i love my brothers we can't play D D with them they, they come in like wrecking balls they're not there to play and have fun they're there to destroy the game as much as they possibly can <laughs> yeah we've tried and um you know i always tell people you know my player is that you know like this alchemy it it's such a strange balance for our group. You have to be lighthearted enough to be able to have people bust your balls and you can shake it off. But also you got to take the game seriously enough that we're, we will, it's hard to invest in role playing your character with some other player if they're not taking it seriously enough to bounce ideas. It's like improv acting. If only one person's doing it out of the duo, it falls apart. You have to have them both back and forth, like ping pong off each other. And it's such a weird puzzle, jigsaw with personalities that even if a person's a really great person, it just sometimes doesn't fit. And when it comes to relationships, that can be hard to hear if it's you want to bring somebody in and the group says, we're not feeling this. And then you got to tell the person you're with, sorry, you're not invited. That's tough. I, I, I can... I've been there. So yeah, it's weird. It's a weird alchemy of personalities that this game can bring out, but that's also, it's a great rule you have because you're protecting the group that has already invested time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears into your game, your campaigns, your adventures with each other. They have four real relationships. And if you let just anybody pop in, they can tear that apart and then you've got nothing anymore. And you, I don't have a formal rule for that, but it's an unspoken rule in my table too. That goes to the, um, the, the mood of the player piece of it, because, you know, as we've talked about, you and I kind of, we're a little more out. We put a little more out there for people. I think um, there are a couple of players in my most recent game who aren't necessarily that comfortable putting themselves out there. It takes time to develop that level of trust for that person to put on a silly voice or for that person to say, you know, I disguise myself and my voice, you know, suddenly my character says, well, I'm going out to do the following things, you know, and, and, and getting that level of comfort. You can't drop somebody new into that and have still have that comfort level. You need time to, to let those things sort of even out. Yeah. I think for us introverts, it works that way. I played in college with a group of drama majors. I was the only non-drama major in the group. It, it was weird for me because they were so comfortable doing accents and, and playing out intricate storylines between characters, romances and betrayals. They were writing plays for each other and with their dialogue and their actions. And for me, a guy with I'm mostly there to kill stuff and loot it at that point, you know, and tell a little bit of a story along the way. It was like a fish Great on a story, wall. bro. <laughs> yeah, Where's my weird. sword? I felt weird. They're all doing voices. And I'm like, what is going on with you people? Is this just, are you all, you know, deranged? Um, th that works both ways. And obviously they were very welcoming, but I was, I was the odd man out in that situation. And I, you know, I, I might've, messed up their flow at times without trying to. It's just like, we're not the same wavelength, dude. I am not going to have my character discuss his sex life with your character in front of four other people. But, uh, yeah, well, and that's another one. So you sort of touched on it with the theme and the mood uh, combo. Um, what your players are comfortable with in terms of the material that you go into. Um, I, I try to keep my game PG-13. Mm -hmm. I, I stay away from being overly descriptive about any particular thing, um, be it either violence or sexuality. Um, we, we do have a bard who will attempt to sleep with anything under the sun and some things not under the sun. <laughs> um, but we try to not make that 
or I say we, I try to not make that something that goes really beyond sort of a PG 13 thing. You know, I, I want the, I don't want the game to devolve into like you say, writing a romance play for some of the characters. If the characters want to go that way, I can certainly talk about it and, and start to move on that sort of a thing, but that will change the feel that will change the feeling when we're sitting there. The mood will change a little bit. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, every group's different. I, I wouldn't presume to judge what's better or not. My group will go as dark. I, I, I have not found the bottom yet, and I have pushed on some descriptions and some themes <laughs> and some, set, some encounters that I thought they would, they would say, Uncle, we, we're not going to go here. And they just every time go, okay, we're going there. So maybe I'm fortunate, maybe I'm not, but uh, I'm starting an evil campaign in the near future. We've tried before. I think this time they want to go all, you know, no kid gloves. Let's let's see what evil really can do under the hood when you supercharge it and let's let it roam. And I'm like, okay. So I'm going to have to harness everything I can think of to see if I can find where they, where they finally say, okay, John, that, that's, that's too far. You've gone too far. I don't know if I'm going to find it or not. <laughs> that's interesting. I, I, I look forward to hearing about that. Yeah, that's... Because- we're planning on maybe putting it on uh, the channel, but I don't know. I don't know if they want their id to bleed through on on online. And I get it because, like, like you said, the alchemy of being comfortable doing these things. My group, we're very comfortable. We've known each other for years and years. We've role played so many wonderful things together. They're very comfortable in our small group. I don't know if they're gonna want to be. They don't want to be filmed doing that. That could be too much. Maybe I'll film it and let them watch it first. <laughs> Are you sure you want this to be out there? Because this isn't a nice campaign. <laughs> so, and, and it does. Those sort of things, those sort of things are one of the really cool parts about role playing is you, you're, you're exactly that. You're playing a role. The character, the, the one that I go back to all the time, the one I keep telling you about, the anti-paladin, mm-hmm it keeps coming up because it's so against my normal character. You know, this guy was a heartless bastard. He had a soul stealing sword and he would literally, they, they started calling him horse killer (laughs) because the character would ride horses to death rather than, rather than like using animal handling or any other skill like that. He's like, no, screw that. I'll ride it till it dies. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I'll take what I need from it and move on or, you know, do something horrible, like push the horse out front in, in, into the monster horde or, or whatever. I mean, yeah, just like, like completely heartless about it. I think they tallied it up at more than two dozen horses by the time that character died. He earned his name. It's like, it's just like, no, it's a horse. Uh-huh. You know, and the druids over there freaking out because she's talking to them like you got to stop. <laughs> they have names; they're people. <laughs> yeah, no. Nah, nah. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm sorry. I would, I would never. I would never do. I would never be that kind of person. That's not me. Well, no, you know yeah, I mean? of course not. But you know, when you roll, but it was hilarious to play it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's fun to play something so not you. Um, just it's liberating sometimes just to make, you know, cause we all have things pent up parts of our personality that we don't let out because they're not socially acceptable, you know, and whatever it is, our fear that we won't be accepted by others. If they know that we like, you know, my little pony or something, you know, there's little things, that, you know, so role playing can be a healthy way to sort of like vomit out this stuff from your lower reaches, you know, of your, <laughs> in a safe way and nobody gets hurt for real. And we all know it's just play. Yeah. Your friends don't think you're too much of a weirdo. <laughs> oh, they all know I'm a weirdo. So anything else? For, um, that's all I've got listed as far as um, mood setters and mood enhancers for uh, the game. Anything else that I didn't cover that you want to go over? Um, we kind of brushed across it. Um, miniatures, tabletop stuff, um, terrain, things like that can be a real help. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are, uh, as you say, wealthy, you can go out and buy some amazing stuff, pay the artists. Um, there's a couple of companies out there that make just 
glorious resin terrain, mm. but I don't have that many hundreds of dollars to drop on it. I, I wish I did. Um, so what I have done is I have started to be that artsy side of me has started to craft things and I've started, I've, I've actually, I'm, I'm part of a group, the, um, uh, tabletop crafters guild, mm-hmm. uh, on social media. And, and I'm just watching these amazing people. They're like, no, no, no. If you get like a 50 cent tube of paint and some old foam insulation and you have like a utility knife, and a pen you can totally build your own terrain i'm like okay and i i just i have fallen down that rabbit hole and for again because i am not rich for a couple of bucks i've started building my own terrain that i can use i haven't had the opportunity to use it in person since we've i've been doing all this since we've been in quarantine but i hear I have one kicking around. Yeah. It looks like dungeon, yeah. right? Dude, it's house insulation. Wow. Very cool. So you could buy like a sheet of this for like five bucks and you just carve it up and put some freaking paint on it and that's it. Yeah. And it looks like a piece of dungeon and you set your you set you you set that out for the players who who get that little extra piece of visual. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, oh, so, okay, so um, as I'm looking at it, I move over there. And that can really help people's thought process. It helps get them into that mood bubble, if you will, where they're thinking about that sort of thing. I agree. I've used measures for a long time now. I I almost wouldn't want to play without them if I had a choice. That's why I love Roll20 now. I said it makes it so easy to make maps and, uh, you know, miniatures and all that stuff. It, 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 it meshes well with our game, but you're right. Uh, those kind of visuals, tactile things you can feel too, um, just add to the game. And you can do it all theater of the mind, and that's wonderful too. It's just not everybody has the same imagination. Some people want to see, feel the, an item to lock them into the character of the, of the, of the fight more. Um, so I, why not? I mean, I've got more than my share of miniatures, trust me. <laughs> I may have a few too. That's a here and there. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Attacks of Opportunity. I hope you enjoyed it. Please hit the subscribe button below. We really appreciate that. Um, we didn't get time to do the second part of our video today. We're going to do expectations of players next week. So we'll see you then. Have a great one. Bye bye.